We open our Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We're going to talk this morning about the resurrected Jesus. Now, Jesus came to this world in human form. He could be hurt. If you cut him, he would bleed. He could experience hunger. He could be thirsty. He could be weary. But Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And unlike all of us, Jesus had a post-death ministry on this earth. Jesus did some things here after he died and came back. And so we're going to talk about the resurrected Jesus. What was Jesus like in his resurrected form? What was he like after he had beat death? After he had been glorified? After he had been given his new resurrection body? In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, we have Luke writing, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, and is after his suffering on the cross, by many infallible proofs. Many infallible proofs. In other words, a multitude of undeniable evidences that he was Jesus who was dead and is now alive. Many infallible proofs. Being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to gain a great understanding of your power, your presence, and your provision as you came back from the grave and ministered to your disciples, Lord, after you had come back in your resurrection form. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. While all human biographies follow a conventional path, you may talk about their birth, you may talk about their life, and then you may talk about their death. Jesus' biography includes a post-death ministry. You and I, when we die, that's the end of our story. But Jesus died and rose again and continued his story on earth. He had quite an interesting post-death ministry, if you will. And he convinced his doubting disciples so confidently and so convincingly that they went out and testified everywhere they went, he's alive. And under threat of torture and under threat of death, they did not change their story. They stayed with it. Now, there are people who might, because of some kind of zeal, stick with a story uh, as long as they thought they could profit from it or some advantage could be gained. But when you see multitudes of people that swear and say, I saw him with my own eyes, I know that it was a resurrected Christ, and no matter what they did to them, they kept with their story. This is a great evidence of the reality of the resurrection. And so they were so convinced that they went, went out and they changed the world with the gospel message. Now, a study of Jesus' actions after the resurrection is a powerful revelation of his ongoing ministry. Now, Jesus said, I go to the Father, and he eventually did. He, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he, he, he went away. He was taken up. He went to the Father. But he said, if I do, I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you. Now, let's understand this. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ. The Holy Spirit is Christ's Spirit. And he is with us in the church in this age. And so Jesus is alive today and his ministry continues today. And so we're going to look at the things that Jesus did in his post-death ministry, in his resurrection ministry, the resurrected Jesus, uh, and understand that these kind of things are going on today in the family of faith through the Holy Spirit. First of all, he displayed his power. When Jesus came back from the grave, he displayed power. First of all, power over physical limitations. Now, they did several things to keep Jesus in the grave. One of the things they did was roll this big stone upon the mouth of the cave that was a physical barrier. Now, here's the thing. 
you can't box God in. You can't put a physical barrier against Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, and it be effective against Him. But they did. They tried to make this physical barrier against anyone coming out or anyone going in. Uh, and so he had power over the physical grave. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 28, verse 1 and 2, <clears throat> In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the stone from the door and sat on it. So this physical barrier was nothing to Jesus. One of his angels just came and rolled it away. And he said, I think I'll sit on this just to show, you know. I mean, he could have gone back up and said, job over. But he was sitting on the stone saying, yeah, I rolled it out of the way. And so the physical barrier is removed. So Jesus showed his power over a physical barrier. He also showed his power over time and space. Now, we have physical barriers that we have to deal with, but one of the real barriers we have to deal with is this thing called time and space. We can only be here and now. We can't be there and then and here and now at the same time. We are limited by space and limited by time. But Jesus, in his resurrection form, displayed his power over time and space. And here's how he could do it. He could just appear and just be there. Now that's power. To not be there and all of a sudden be there. This happened more than once. I mean, they're in a room and they're talking. All of a sudden, poof, there he is. And the first thing he said when he just poof and there he was is fear not. And the reason he said fear not is because wouldn't you be afraid if you're in a locked room and somebody just appeared out of nowhere? I think the first feeling I'd have would be one of, of apprehension of some sort. And so Jesus had power over time and space. Uh, when Jesus resurrected, uh, Mary was there and she wanted to, to touch him and to embrace him. And he said, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my father. And so he did ascend to his father and then he came back. So, so Jesus could travel, listen, he could travel between the spiritual and the physical dimensions at will. He could go with the Father and he could come back. Uh, he, he could be uh, in the world of the Spirit and he could be in the world that you and I occupy at will. That's his resurrection form. Uh, and so that showed Jesus power. He also had power over politics. You see, in addition to rolling that big stone over the mouth of that sepulcher, they also put a Roman seal on it. Now that is they melted wax where the stone met the wall of that sepulcher. And at that juncture, they would put a Roman stamp. And by law, no one could remove that seal under penalty of death. Now, what hubris for politicians to think, well, we've made it against the law for Jesus to come out of the grave. Can't do that. It's against Roman law. We've said so. And we've actually put a seal, and it means if you break that seal, uh, that, that it's under penalty of death. Well, listen, they, they'd already killed Jesus once. And that's the only time he was going to be killed was once, because that's what it took to earn our salvation. Now he's alive. And guess what? Jesus has no problem overcoming earthly politics. It's not an issue. And listen, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says that the armies of the world will unite against him, but he will defeat them with a word. Listen, Jesus isn't going to have any problem with worldly governments or powers that be. So he displayed his power over politics. Listen, the, the power people had no power over Jesus. The movers and shakers, the big shots, had no power over Jesus. When Jesus wanted to do something, he would just do it. Now, now you and I in this life, we're sometimes limited uh, because of politics or limited because of what people will allow and what they won't allow. But, but here's the thing. If God has told you in his word to do something, if God has told you in his word that something is true, politics does not have power over that. They may assume it. They may try to take it. They may usurp it. But God Almighty in heaven gives us power by virtue of the Holy Spirit to tell the truth and to do what's right if the whole world makes it illegal. 
We have the ability by Jesus Christ. Now, we may have to take the penalty for it as martyrs did. But here's the thing. God is the great equalizer. And for everything that human politics may take, God gives back in greater measure. We cannot lose. Jesus is not intimidated by human politics. Now, not only did he, dis, uh, did he uh, show his power, but he also showed his presence. He was there. He was personally there with them. His body, himself. And it was amazing how his presence was manifested. So let's ask ourselves, what was it like when Jesus was present? When Jesus was in the room, when Jesus was in your midst, what was it like? Now, sometimes we may have a, an activity or a party and a gathering of some sort, and we might have a certain person that maybe they're the one that others hope will come. Uh, they may be called the life of the party. And when they're not there, the party maybe isn't as good as it once could have been. Are you with me? Nothing was like it except when Jesus was there. There was no comparison without Jesus, with Jesus. With Jesus was way better. With Jesus was really something to talk about. And what was it like when Jesus was there? Well, he did things like this. He comforted the heavy-hearted. He talked to Mary. He talked to the disciples. He talked to their hearts. He, he would bring comfort when he was there. Listen, when Jesus shows up, he brings comfort. Do you ever need comfort? Jesus brings it. When we go to him, he can comfort our hearts. He says, don't worry. Don't fear. I'm with you, and I'll stay with you. I'll be with you to the end. He brought comfort. He also gave an instruction. Uh, he would catch them up to speed. Uh, one of the ways that Jesus' presence showed was an interesting thing, is that part when he, he showed up incognito with uh, two men who were walking along the road to a, a town called Emmaus. They were walking along the road, and they were sad, and they were talking about how Jesus had been crucified, and the one that they had their hopes in was now gone. And so Jesus just appears. And he says, what are you fellas talking about? And they say, well, are you a stranger in Israel? I mean, you just came to town. You haven't heard uh, the great master, the great teacher from Galilee who did many wonderful things. Uh, and now they've killed him. And, and there's some people saying he, that his tomb was empty. And, and then, then Jesus, and they didn't know it was him. He said, oh, fools and slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Now, here's this religious scholar rebuking them. And he began with Moses and all the prophets and expounded to them the things concerning himself. Listen, Jesus gave them a tour of the Old Testament scriptures, such as never had been done, showing about Messiah, how he would suffer, how he would die, and how he would rise again. And so they came to a fork in the road, and Jesus was going to go further, and they said, hey, why don't you come talk with us some more? They, they really enjoyed that Bible study, and they wanted some more. This fellow really knew his Bible. They wanted to hear more. And so he said, okay. And so he went, and they still don't know it's him. He's there, but they don't know it. They don't know it's him, but he's there. And they go to a place where they're going to have a meal. And Jesus, who they didn't know it was Jesus, began to break the bread. And all of a sudden, their eyes open. It's Jesus. And then, poof, he was gone. What was it like when Jesus was around? Here's what they said. Did not our heart burn within us when he talked with us and opened to us the scriptures? Didn't we feel a warmth? Didn't we feel a presence when he was with us? Even before we knew it was Jesus, we knew something was on. We knew something was happening. And listen, that's how it is when Jesus shows up today through his Holy Spirit. And you may not even be aware of it. You may not see it coming. You may think, well, this is just normal, but something's going on. And, and wait a minute, that's Jesus. And then when you know it is, it's really something. When you know Jesus has been here, Jesus has done something. Jesus was present. Now, he also rebuked the doubting, as with Thomas. He restored the errant, as he did with Peter, who had denied the Lord. He brought Peter back in. He gave authority to them. He gave them power. He, he told them to go out and spread the gospel. And he directed his church. He told them uh, to stay in Jerusalem. And he gave them instructions and directions. That's what Jesus does when he's present. Listen, part of what Jesus does when he's present is he tells you what to do. 
you call me master and you say, well, for so I am. Now, we don't have any earthly master. We don't like that kind of language. Uh, we're free people, right? Except when it comes to Jesus and we are all servants to him. He is our master. He is our Lord. He tells us what to do. Listen, if you don't want to be told what to do, then don't get saved. I'm just warning you. Because that Holy Spirit of God is going to come to your heart and tell you some things to do. And but here's the thing. They'll all be good things. There'll be things that are in your best interest. There'll be things that if you don't do them, you will have cheated yourself out of a better life. Jesus never tells you to do something except it's good and in your best interest to do it. Make no mistake about it. Jesus doesn't sit up in heaven on the right hand of the Father rubbing his hands saying, how can I make their lives miserable today? He doesn't sit on the right hand of the Father and, and look down on you as an individual believer and say, how can I mess their lives up? No, he says, I want you to obey me because I know what's right and I am going to give you advice. I'm going to give you instruction that's good for you. Jesus displayed his presence by giving them direction. And sometimes he did this incognito. You know, every now and then Jesus pays a visit to me and I don't know it's him until later. Sometimes I may even resist it. Sometimes God has led me to do something and I said, I don't want to do that. Ah. But somehow I feel led to do it, and I do it, and I look back and I say, well, you know, Lord, that was good. You led me to do it. Listen, do, do you think those people who were walking on the road to Emmaus enjoyed having this stranger refer to them as fools and slow to believe? Well, no. But when he started talking and explaining to them the Scriptures, they realized how foolish they had been and how unbelieving they had been. Somebody, somewhere, has to have permission to straighten us out when we're wrong and to correct us when we have the, the wrong idea. Also, when Jesus was there, and th this is a part of it, he could enjoy fellowship. Now, now, when I say that, he could enjoy fellowship. He would help you enjoy fellowship, but Jesus would also enjoy fellowship. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 36. Let's look at this, because this, this is a beautiful part of Jesus' ministry in his resurrected form. He's risen from the grave. He's in his resurrection body. He's appearing to his disciples. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. So he calms them down. But they were, they were terrified and affrighted, suppose they had seen a spirit. Now notice what they did in, in verse 38. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Well, I know why. Because somebody in a locked room had just appeared out of nowhere. That, that's why they're, they're going through that. So what's he said? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now Jesus appeared in his glorified body and you could touch him he had substance and here's here's the, the the wonder of it because he chose to do so he still had the scars he chose to keep those he could have had a resurrection body without them i'm hoping when i get my resurrection body that my scars are gone i'm hoping that when you get your resurrection body uh, parts of you that are missing are now not missing. I hope that when I get my resurrection body, all the reminders on me of foolish things I've done or dangerous things I've done are not part of my resurrection body. I mean, I could talk for an hour about it, but I'll spare you the details. Jesus chose to keep those particular scars as testimony throughout eternity that He paid for our sins. And those scars will be to us beautiful. Those scars will be to us a reminder of the sacrifice he made for us and the love we should have for him. He said, look at me. It's me. I've got these scars. It's me. Touch me. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. I'm a person. Handle me. And so he's doing that. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, <laughs> he's still trying to convince them he, he's got a body. He said, have you any meat? That's, you know, you got anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. That's a pretty good lunch. Fish and honey. And he took it 
and did eat before them. Jesus appeared in a locked room, said, touch me and handle me, give me something to eat, and he could eat in front of them. They knew he was alive. This is part of the many infallible proofs. that he could. Listen, they had a meal with Jesus after he was dead. They had a meal with Jesus after he'd come back in his resurrection body. They ate it. See, I had lunch with Jesus the other day. What'd you have? Well, fish and honeycomb. Did he like it? Well, he appeared to like it. You know, you, you could have, can you imagine saying, yeah, I had lunch with Jesus? They did. So he displayed his presence among them. And listen, through the virtue of the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus is present with us. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, Jesus is now seated on the right hand of, the, of power in heaven. So his physical presence is, he, is in heaven. So how is it that Jesus is with us in the midst? It's through his Holy Spirit. And in the midst of the congregation, Jesus says, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to thee. Listen, when we sing hymns to God, when we sing praise to God, the Bible says Jesus is present with us and he's participating in our worship with us too. That puts a whole different meaning on what we do if we think about it that way. Jesus wanted them to know it was really him. Listen, we, we never have any reason to doubt or fear the presence of Jesus. When Jesus is in the room, it's good. When Jesus is present, it's all good. Listen, if you're afraid to go to Jesus, if you're afraid to go to Jesus, somebody has misrepresented Jesus to you or you have misrepresented Jesus to your own self. Because when you come to Jesus, you come to Him for forgiveness, for healing, for power, for restoration, for truth, for comfort, and all the good things. Listen, you, you're holding on to some sin that's keeping you from Jesus, you're cheating yourself. You're holding on to some ideology that keeps you from accepting Christ. You're cheating yourself. I don't care what it is. Well, whatever end of the political spectrum, everything in between. If there's anything keeping you from Jesus and His presence, that's something you need to deal with and get out of the way and come to the presence of Jesus and you will find it's all good. It's all good. He also displayed His provision. His provision. Now, some of the things Jesus did when he came back in his resurrection body are, are, are interesting to me. You see, the disciples, not knowing what to do, because they were kind of in limbo now, they'd heard about the resurrection, they, they'd seen him, and, but they got to make a living, you know, they got to eat. And so Simon Peter, he says, I'm going to go fishing. And they'll say, well, we'll go fishing too. And so they go fishing. And so they're out fishing all night, but they're not catching anything. You ever do that? Man, I hate that. I'm a, I'm a fisherman, and when I go fishing, I want to catch fish. I have been fishing and not caught anything. It's really a bummer. But now I can imagine professional fishermen who have real boats and real nets, uh, and they're not catching anything. Well, they're out there and nothing's going on. So they see this stranger on the shore, this fellow walking around. And he said... Children, you have any food? Now, that in the south, along the Gulf of Mexico, when you're walking along and you see fishermen, here's what you ask. Catch anything? It's just what you do. So that's kind of like this. Jesus is on the shore, and they're close enough to, to hear words. Did you catch anything? And they had to admit, no. And he says, throw the net on the other side. You'll catch something. Okay, might as well try something. So they did. And then they got this great big net full of fish. Listen, did you ever get deja vu? You see, deja vu got a hold of these guys because that was a scene that had happened not too long ago where someone named Jesus told them to go one more time at the net and they caught a lot of fish. And John was the first one to catch it. Or at least the first one to say it. Here's what he said. It's the Lord. This doesn't happen normally. This isn't usual fishing. This isn't something that happens without supernatural power. That's Jesus. That's the Lord. And what happened? They begin to lower a boat to get in. And so Simon, he just dives in and swims to Jesus. He needs to get to Jesus. He needs to get to him right now. And so he dives in and he goes. And so what happened when this scene was going on. 
Well, let's catch it. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're trying to get something to eat. They need something to eat. They need food. They need the wherewithal to live. Jesus knows that. Now, have you ever had your physical needs met by God's grace? What preceded that? Having a physical need. You see, you can't get your physical needs met until you first experience a physical need. It, you know what it's like to get your hunger uh, addressed when you're first hungry. Uh, if you're weary, uh, then you know what rest is. Uh, if you're sick, then you know what it is to be healed. You see, they were experiencing a tough time fishing all night and having nothing. And so what did they need? They were engaged in a normal pursuit for food, for sustenance. They were working very hard to get it, doing all the things they knew to do, and yet were getting no results. And so Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. He tells them how to do it, and now they get results. Now they have their needs met. You see what happens when the Lord is there? He not only shows His power, He not only shows His presence, but He brings His provision. He gave them what they needed. Now they had a lot of fish, a lot of fish to eat, some to sell. They were doing pretty good. But now notice what happened. They came to the, the beach, and Jesus already had some fish. And it was cooked. It was ready to eat. You know, that's fish you can deal with later. Here, let's have a meal now. He already had it. You see, Jesus doesn't need your fish. He doesn't need your money. I don't believe in poor Jesus, do you? There's been times when I believed in poor Mark. There's times I've seen poor. But I don't believe in poor Jesus. Jesus isn't poor. He's not broke. He doesn't need to beg for money. He wasn't on the shore saying, please bring me something to eat. I don't know what I'm going to do without you fellas out there fishing. No. Jesus had his own meal. What he does is bring provision for you if you trust him and if you listen to him. Now, Jesus was already way ahead of them for the meal. And his timing takes in ultimate success. But listen, let's not forget the fact that they fished all night long with nothing. You see, it's not instant success all the time. Don't think it is. Jesus never said everything you do is going to work. Jesus never said every time you go fishing, you're going to catch fish. Every time you try a business, it's going to succeed. Every endeavor you undertake is going to, to, to achieve its goals. No, but if we are busy and if we are doing what we need to do, when Jesus shows up, he'll bring it all to pass and it'll be right. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20, now remember, Jesus was physically with the disciples, physically with them in his resurrection body. And when he gave them the great commission, among other things, here's what he said. And lo, which means look, behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. I'm with you always. And then he left. Wait a minute. You said you would be with us always, even until the end of the age, and you even said amen on the end. And now you're going up. And he said, it's good for you that I'm ascending to the Father. Because if I ascend not to the Father, the Comforter will not come down. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit. He says, it's good for you that I go up. Because when I do, the Holy Spirit presence will come down and be with you. And that is how he is with us throughout the end of the age. Now, Jesus can be with us here and with them there and with them there and with them there all at the same time. And when you pray through the Holy Spirit, you've got the ear of Jesus Christ. At the same time, the most dedicated, sold-out missionary or evangelist in the whole world may be praying, and God has 100% attention just for you at the same time. Listen, I'm glad that when I pray, God doesn't give me a busy signal. I'm glad that when I pray, God has all the time in eternity just to hear me, and the same for you. Now, why do we sometimes find ourselves far from His presence? Why do we sometimes find ourselves 
removed from His power, from His presence, and from His provision. Here it is. We're not walking in the Spirit. Because it is through the Spirit. And by the way, Baptists don't need to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. He's our Holy Spirit. Our Holy Spirit. Pentecost is our story. The, the, the anointing that God gave the church is our anointing. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit because Jesus sent the presence of the Holy Spirit to you and to me. And we have that presence through the Holy Spirit of God. And we have through that all the things that Jesus did in His person. Now we have available to us through His Spirit. Thomas as we saw in that video earlier. He doubted. Now think of what he was saying. Think of what he was saying. The women had said, the tomb was empty, and we saw him. The disciples who had been meeting, and Thomas wasn't in the room, Jesus appeared to his friends, Peter and John and the others, and they said, we saw him. Jesus appeared. And he said, I don't believe you. Now can, can you imagine telling your fellow disciples you guys had some mass delusion or something? Or maybe you, you ate some funny mushrooms. You know, maybe he, he, he made up some excuse. Why would they say that? Why would they think that? He said, I, I just, no, I can't buy it. I can't believe it. And he said, I, I won't believe it until I'm able to touch those scars. Then I'll believe it. So, for a, many days, he's attending church. It's the church of the closed door because they're afraid. So he attends and he's there and he's there and he's there. And then one day he's there, poof, Jesus show, shows up. And, and you know, Jesus shows and he said, Thomas, bring forth your hand. Bring forth your finger. Touch. Put your hand over here. Be not faithless, but believing. And you know what Thomas did? We don't read anywhere where he actually went up and touched it. We don't read. The, I don't know that he did. But he did fall on his knees. And he said, my Lord and my God. Listen. Jesus said, you have seen and believe. More blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. How do we know that Jesus rose from the dead? Because witnesses saw it and said so. And those witnesses might have well as just been people who said what they said yesterday or this morning. The message is new. Yes, it happened many hundreds of years ago. But the truth of it is as new as if it happened this morning. The time does not diminish facts. Time does not diminish truth. Jesus rose from the grave. Many infallible proofs. Here's how also I know. There are drunkards who have been made into sober citizens, fathers and husbands and tradesmen because of the power of the presence of Christ and their salvation. There have been sinners of every sort struggling with addictions of every sort. There have been criminals who, whose lives have been transformed by the power of the resurrected Christ. Listen, there have been average, everyday people who haven't committed great big crimes. They haven't robbed a bank. They haven't done any great big thing that others would say, oh, what a terrible person. But they have had a longing in their heart and an emptiness in their soul. And when they accept Jesus Christ, His presence comes in and gives them new life, gives them joy. Listen, don't run from the presence of Christ. He is there for you. As a teenage boy, I heard the gospel. I was convicted about my need for the Savior. And I responded in faith to Jesus Christ. And He saved my soul, but He also saved my life. He gave me purpose. He gave me joy. He gave me a reason to live. And yes, I've gone through trials and tribulations and difficulties. I know what it's like to experience setbacks. I know what it's like to have times that are difficult. But I also know this. Jesus' presence has been with me through all of it. And I would rather have anything happen to me with Jesus 
than anything good happen to me without Him. Dear Father, help us to grasp the overwhelming truth that You are present in Your church today. You are present in our lives. And that if anyone will come to You in faith and believe the gospel, that You will save them forever and give them eternal life. Lord, I pray that Your presence would guide us, instruct us. Lord, if necessary, rebuke us, heal us, restore us. Lord, that bring us joy. Meet our needs, we pray, as we struggle to be fair and just with our neighbors. Lord, give us the ability to forgive others. Lord, knowing that in doing so, we can receive wonderful forgiveness from You. Lord, I pray that You would help us to rejoice in the resurrected Christ all year long. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Let's stand together and let